Welcome to the Ethics Movement. This is a show about ethics and compliance, how we're making the world a better place. I'm Tom Fox, the Compliance Evangelist. And I'm Philip Winterburn, Chief Strategy Officer at Conversant by OneTrust. In today's episode, we're joined by Ronnie Feldman, founder of Learnings and Entertainments, an agency that provides innovative, creative content for ethics and compliance. Ronnie joins us today to chat about this year's return to the office and how this presents the compliance and ethics profession with an opportunity to reinvent the way we communicate and engage with one another. Philip, let's dive in. All right, so Ronnie, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, before we jump into all the questions and the, and the conversation that I'm really excited to have, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to the audience and explain a little bit of your background and how that ca- how you came into ethics and compliance from that. Yeah, sure. So uh, my name is Ronnie Feldman. I'm the, the president and founder of a company called Learnings and Entertainments. Uh, we go by L&E for short. Um, and... I guess we have a, a fairly interesting story about how we got into this this space. Um, I come from uh, the Chicago improvisational community, uh, improv comedy community, and to no great acclaim, but um, um, was uh, what, what I like to call like some people end up on Saturday Night Live uh, and some people do not. And I was in the latter category. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, strangely enough, I ended up um, creating a corporate education business um, within this place called the Second City, which um, is a Chicago improv comedy institution. And we started making um, uh, uh, creative content, comedic content around workplace behavior issues. And pretty quickly, we started getting hired to do uh, 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 that kind of programming for a lot of companies in the ethics compliance space. So I became the de facto uh, a person who learned about this community. This is about 15 years ago. Um, and so that's how I got into the ethics compliance space is by finding out about these risk topics, finding out how employees screw, screwed up. And then we would make videos highlighting those things that companies could use to teach. And then me and my team left about five years ago to start Learnings and Entertainments, where we continue to expand the different kinds of creative techniques, the different kinds of entertainment devices that can be used to make these very important topics uh, less scary for people. Excellent. So I am absolutely fascinated by comedy and entertainment and how we engage minds and the, the psychology of that, but we're going to get into some of that later on. So but before we get started, I think we're going to dig in, let's dig a little bit about you know the, the state that we find ourselves in right now with the return to work that is happening really across the world at the moment in, in many places. There are some places still locked down and some returning to lockdown, but there are many returning to work. And so as we have this moment of re-engaging our, our employees back in the workforce, back in the office, um, this is an opportunity for us to, I think, reinvent our ENC programs, reinvent how we engage. And so I was wondering if you could share some of your thoughts about what does that mean? And what, what is the opportunity that we have here? Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. Uh, um, I, I talk all, all the time, I like to talk all the time about the importance of reputation uh, in the ethics compliance space um, because people people don't listen. Ethics compliance sometimes are toxic words to employees, right? The, the, the status quo in most organizations with most employees, when they hear those words, they're like, they don't have a good uh, uh, response to it. And this is a problem. Um, the, um, so, you know, there's only a handful of times where you can really reinvent yourself. Sometimes it's it's uh, when you have a new leader that comes into the organization, a new compliance officer, and um, uh, or some other big monumental shift in the organization. But now a lot of social issues have come to the forefront. Um, uh, people work life and work home, uh, situation has been, um, just brought to the forefront. And I think I, I, I tend to think people's empathy levels are a little bit higher. Um, meaning that we're, we're, th- these issues are now being talked about and these lines of between work and home life balance are blurred. And now we're coming back. And because of this, what I like to think of is a, as a monumental shift in, in sort of our lives, we're coming back. I think this is an opportunity to then um, 
reintroduce who ethics compliance is to the organization and how how you're communicating with people. Um, I want to point out that, like, to, in my opinion, the biggest issue that ethics compliance uh, uh, professionals need to deal with is creating a speak up culture. And I think speaking up has um, it's been harder to do that over the pandemic because, uh, you know, people weren't together and weren't seeing each other. Um, and the channels for communication have, were, were harder to get at. Um, so I think the, the, the one of the reasons that we need to think about reinventing ourselves is so that we can be more thoughtful and present in the minds of our employees and leaders as a helpful resource. And so I, I just think the dynamic is ripe right now to, to not do things the way we were doing them before. So Ronnie, um... First of all, it's very interesting to be on this side of the mic from you uh, in this podcast. Uh, we're usually collaborating a little bit more. But one of the things, um, a couple of years ago, I took a couple of classes, one from David Baldacci and one from James Patterson. They're both uh, thriller authors. And they both said the same thing that really interested me, which was the definition of your brand. And they said, I always thought your brand is so it's your logo or what you do or you know how people perceive you. But they said, no, no, no. Your brand is your word. And if in their case, their word to their audience, their customers, their purchasers of books was, we will write you a thriller. And uh, we can change that, but we have to communicate that expectation if we're going to move to a rom-com. Um, and it really struck me that that is a, a great way to think about compliance, because what is our promise to you as the ENC department? What what are we going to deliver to you? And as we come out of this pandemic and really can refocus a lot of things, does that really resonate for you? The promise of compliance. What is compliance going to deliver to its customers? I.e. Uh, company employees? Can we work with employees uh, perhaps to uh, uh, engage with them more directly on compliance initiatives? Can we deliver a value add? Is, is that something that would resonate in a rebranding as you see it? Yeah, absolutely. Like uh, the, 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 I think this is one of the most, if not the most important issue that ethics compliance needs to deal with is um, a recognition that reputation matters. Um, we, we know this from, we go to the, uh, the movies or the theater to see a show, your expectation level changes how you walk into that theater or how you sit down to watch that movie. Um, uh, and and I, if you, one thing that I love about this community is that ethics compliance people for the most part are trying to help and support their employees. They're, they're, you know, we, they're like, we're trying to help you stay out of trouble. And, the, and we're, we're trying to provide you these resources so that you can do your jobs in the most effective and compliant way. But employees don't know that. They just know you from that bad e-learning that to them feels like you're pushing liability off to them, right? It's, it's, it's that stilted, like you can't advance the thing. It's the bad voiceover. It's the stock photography, everything makes your, I, I sometimes have to go through these things because companies ask me to remake their, their trainings for them and I have to watch them and I'm like, this drives me crazy. So we in many ways have created this reputation for ourselves as not a welcoming, helpful resource. They, they look at it as in, they're trying to push liability to me and check the box. And people do not speak up to ask questions when they are annoyed, apathetic or afraid right? People don't go to the office of no, if they view you as the speed bump or the, the, the police officer or the school marm that slaps your hand, you know, um, right or wrong, true or not, that's the reputation. We need to recognize that and then actively work to change it. In comedy, we would say you're not playing to a warm room, right? You have to, you have to do something jarring to shift that perspective. Because this, this ties into psychological safety. Does your community have you guys talked about psychological safety on this podcast before philip talks about it all the time i think a few times yeah yeah 
<laughs> well, good. Well, good. So we won't have to break that down. Like uh, I'm fascinated by psychological safety because, you know, I, I've, uh, there's Amy Edmondson's book and a couple other books, but they're talking about just in my understanding of it is, you know, most people don't like to bring bad news forward. The most innovative and uh, uh, organizations constantly remind employees to bring bad news forward so that it can be solved because everyone's me mean is that they don't do that because people don't want to, you know, cause problems or bring problems forward to be associated with problems. But so you have to constantly remind people to bring bad news forward. Um, strangely enough, this is an interesting tie into the improv world, uh, like improvisation. Uh, and I, for this purposes of this, I'm defining it as like, if, if you've seen the show, if Hughes line is in any way is like a short form improv comedy show or in Chicago, we do something called long form improv where we get suggestions from the audience and we will create a whole comedic play, like an hour long play off the top of our heads. And the way we do that is we create unconditional support amongst the cast. We constantly remind people, in fact, before every show to this day, people still do this it, before every improv show, they look each other in the eye and we, we pat each other on the back and we say, I got, I got your back, I got your back, I got your back. And we constantly reinforce the idea that we have the support of each other so that creatively we can take risks. And no matter what we say, funny or not, right or wrong, agree or not, that it will be supported by the group. Um, and that's how uh, our natural wit and personalities and comedy comes out. Um, Amy Poehler of Parks and Rec fame or Saturday Night Live fame, she has this great quote and she says, um, it's easier to be brave when you're not alone, <laughs> which I love that. So bringing it back to ethics compliance, uh, I think this is the charge of ethics compliance. We need to find a way to not only make, uh, uh, get people to trust you and your organization, the ethics compliance organization, but also to find a way to influence others, leadership, so that they can carry that message forward on your behalf, because there's a few of you and lots of them. So that fundamental shift to me is, is sort of changes what we do. Like, I think, I think it's far less important to train people so that they've read the policies and, know, and say that they know the policies. It's far more important to continually remind people about speaking up and that you have a support system um, and helping others to carry that message forward on your behalf. Can I, I just want to dig into one thing you said a little bit ago, this concept of pushing liability to them. And so many training programs and awareness programs have that feel about them, that the employee is having the liability pushed on them. I trained you, therefore now you're accountable. I've, I've done my job. I'm good. You now own it. How, I think that's a fascinating line because how, because I see it in so many places, people doing exactly that. And in fact, with intention almost to do that, right? I need to do this because the first line of defense is the employee. They need to go do this. And so they actually intend that message almost. And yet the psychological emphasis of that just creates a negative perception on the receiver's side. And so That's you right. reject the message. So I'm, I want to just dig into that a second with you and just hear what, how, how do you... How do you work away from that? How do you change that perception when to some degree it's actually what organizations maybe yeah, kind of do? Well, so in this, I, I might, uh, uh, well, let me, let me say a few things. And then uh, Tom, I, I love the, your perspective on it too, because I don't come up from a legal perspective, but my understanding from like the sentencing guidelines and from what the DOJ has said is that there is no uh, actual, if you get in trouble, they're not, they're looking for what did you do to prevent the problem, right? That's what they want to see. What have you, what is your program done to prevent the problem? Um, what you thought would be helpful. They're not saying how many hours of training did you do? They're not saying, uh, you know, did everybody sign these things? I mean, maybe they asked those things, but the, but the main point, if you get behind what, what they're asking for you is like, what program did you have in place that you think will prevent these problems from happening? and lay that out for us. So if you start from there, like we've we've continued to do this check the box training, this e-learning because we think it's required. I'm not so sure it is. Now, 
look, most programs are still there. I'm trying to make the point to de-emphasize that annual training where you're put, telling them the policy and having them memorize it, de-emphasizing that, um, and, it, and then emphasizing the importance of communication awareness and partnering with the business so that they can help say that you have this support system. If you are doing an e-learning, there are certainly ways to do that that have more of an open hand versus a finger wag. So even if it's an e-learning, it, it, it can start off with, the reason we're, you're having to do this is because we wanna make sure that you, because when people get in trouble, bad things happen, we wanna help you from that. And just know that um, we're gonna teach you this stuff, but if you're not sure, you can always come talk to us. You, you can put that attitude in anything that you're doing. And I would argue you should, constantly back to psychological safety you have to continually remind people of that because that's not their default thinking um yeah let me stop there what are your reactions yeah. no the the uh, i think you you said it earlier is the i got your back if you can frame it as the reason i'm giving you this training is because i've got your back and i this is important information for you to know if you have any questions i'm here because i've got your back and so you're framing it as we're here, we're in this together. And you mentioned the Amy Polo quote, of, it's easy to be brave when you're not alone. So you're not alone. We're That's here. That's right. We're not here to slap your wrist. Sorry so to keep jumping over, brave. but we're not here to slap your wrist. We're here to like, to say, let's solve this problem together. It's more of the values-based thing that a lot of companies are moving to, not a, a rules-based, it's values-based. Like, you know, the right kinds of things. I mean, there's all the psychology behind why people do bad things. And it's rarely a bad person doing a bad thing. It's like, they know the rule, they know the right answer. And they're like, yeah, but I deserve this. Or there's other, other sociological issues. The cults, you know, I worked extra hard. I deserve to this little perk or I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I just, this, this makes me uncomfortable. I'm just going to not think about it and avoid it. And so these are all the social issues that, of why people do quote unquote the wrong thing that have nothing to do with knowledge and information, which is why, again, I think if there's, they say, uh, uh, I love the, there's a quote like, um, uh, uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. I like culture eats training for breakfast. The training doesn't mean anything if you have a culture that supports excuses and like, well, I know that's how we're supposed to do, but this is, this is, you know, I deserve this, or this is what we do here, you know? So what I would say really more from kind of the legal perspective is what the DOJ wants in terms of training and communication is effectiveness. Your overall compliance program must be operationalized and effective. And if there is a problem, did you step in and fix the problem? So you're, you're going to have issues arise. And the key is, what did you do? One, did you have a system that allowed that issue to arise? whether it's a speak up culture, whether it's an internal control, you pick it up. But after it has arisen, what did you do to remedy it? Or what remediation did you uh, use? And then the, uh, I mean, I used to talk about training. And one thing I learned from Ronnie, Tom, it's not training, it's communication. If you call it training, then, you know, uh, Sister Martha, Sister Mary Elephant is in the background. Uh, training you with the ruler. And if it's communication, it's sharing of information that we all can use together. And that's really one of the beauties of what Ronnie and his team have brought to the compliance community is really a different way to think, think about training, not really a legal based. Uh, I wouldn't even say entertainment based, but as a way uh, to get your message across that people will appreciate, enjoy, but actually listen to. So uh, I I think that fits uh, what Ronnie said really fits exactly into kind of the format the uh, the Department of Justice has given us. And that uh, really, Ronnie, that leads to the next kind of general topic I wanted to explore with you, which is uh, entertainment and how you approach the type of training that learnings and entertainments creates. How, how does your professional background teach you that? communication can be effective and how are you able to employ that into literally a 
you know, billion dollar corporations that you've worked with uh, over the past few years and and be able to communicate the, the message of an ENC program. Yeah, well, th- thanks for that. I, like, I, I, and, and by the way, every year that I get closer and closer to this community and I, you know, I feel a part of it uh, um, and the more compliance, ethics compliance officers that I speak with, the more I continue to learn from their point of view and start figuring out different ways you can apply improv, comedy, and more broadly entertainment techniques. Because I think that those are very valuable ways uh, to um, uh, get people's attention to increase uh, memory and recall, to stand out, to open up conversations. I think entertainment has a really valuable uh, place in it. And it's, it's a weird thing for some companies because it's such a serious, weighty topic if you're talking about harassment and discrimination and racism and and corruption. I mean, these are like very important things. I think it's, um, but we all, uh, but let me say it this way. We all recognize in our non-work lives that things that are more entertaining <laughs> are, are beneficial to us. Like if people have kids, they know that when their teachers are entertaining, the kids learn more. You know, that's why there was Schoolhouse Rock when I was kid, a, a kid and, and the electric company. And I don't know, my da- my references are dated. But the <laughs> but the point is that we all intuitively know that things are when they're more entertaining, um, we tend to remember them. This is also why we also remember jingles, you know, 1-800-CARS-FOR-KIDS or, uh, the, you know, the, the, there's the Geico commercials. Um, are funny, but they don't undermine the product. There's all sorts of examples in our in our everyday lives that show that a very serious subject can be tackled in an entertaining way in service of that message. Um, but I get it. Like uh, most of the companies I talk to, uh, uh, they always say, I think this is so great, but we're really conservative, right? Th- this is a conversation I have multiple times a day, every day, because everybody says it. And it's fascinating to me because what it means is I'm a cool person and I have this, you know, this uh, well-rounded personality, but my company doesn't. And it's just not true because your company is made up of people just like you. So it's a matter of, um, I think, building a proper business case for why to be more entertaining and how you train and communicate because there is a good business case for these things. Um, so as you have to sell these concepts into the organization, um, this is one of the reasons I write and talk about these subjects so much because it is a, it is a better solution. <laughs> okay, so uh, with that as a backdrop, let me sort of break down some, I guess, techniques, if you will. Um, so we, I think it's sometimes helpful to think, uh, let's talk about com- communication. It's sometimes helpful to think of it like, advertising as opposed to training and uh, i use that word intentionally because an advertisement tells you a simple message in an interesting way as quickly as possible and then for more information you go here so when you're talking about speaking up or uh, 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 you know conflicts or corruption or any of these things you don't have to I mean, maybe you do a training that explains what it is and why it is in some examples. I think that's sometimes helpful. Um, but more people need reminding more than they need instruction. So if you think about a commercial, something that's short and entertaining can live in more places. It allows you to um, push that out more frequently. You know, if you're doing email pushes or newsletter pushes or you have Slack or Yammer or Jive or some of these social channels, like it allows you to push that out more frequently, it, and it also allows you to embed those messages in more places. So think of it like uh, if you have a, a, a an entertaining 30 to 60 second video, you can get a leader to play that prior to their Zoom meeting. You can show up in a safety training, you can show up in a leadership training, you can show up at a, at a meeting where you're not on the agenda. So I think it's really helpful to, to take that advertising mentality. And the only way that you can get that increased repetition and increased uh, uh, visibility uh, by getting others to, to use 
this content on your behalf is if it's entertaining <laughs> or else they won't do it. You know, if you give them a, a, a wag the finger or an overly inspirational thing that falls flat, they're just not going to want to play it because it, it feels false. So I think our challenge is um, simplify messaging and get that messaging out as, as often as possible. And if you want to get that message out as often as possible, you got to find a variety of ways to um, change the wrapper of, of, of how that message is, is being perceived. So, so the, the message, the content of the message, you know, we speak up, uh, our values are important to us. You have, you have support if you need it. Here's how you do it. Those are simple messages. You got to keep changing the way you, you get that out so that it feels fresh and interesting. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I think that's a sort of a helpful way to, to think about it. There, there's other techniques for, from a training perspective. Um, oh, let me say one, one other thing. Uh, I, I'm probably talking over your questions, but I, I want to point out that entertainment is not just comedy because everybody has a different perspective about what's funny, <laughs> right? Uh, so one of the reasons I call the company Learnings and Entertainments is because entertainment can be storytelling or drama or music um, or, uh, or, or it, you know, it can be par parodying uh, an infomercial or a movie trailer or a talk show or a game show or different mediums, uh, a GIF or a meme. Things don't have to be funny. I think humor is helpful, but uh, uh, I think that there's no single way to engage a multi-generational, multicultural workforce. So the way that you engage th these big companies is you have to try lots and lots of little things so that you have the best opportunity to engage uh, the most people over time through variety and surprise. Uh, that was a, a key question I had for you, I think, in terms of around because people get intimidated with the idea of if, I have, if I'm making this entertaining, I have to make it funny. And what I find funny may not be what someone else finds funny, especially when you're in a global company and you're dealing with multiple different cultures and perspectives. And it, it then that then causes them to step back and say, OK, so I can't do humor in here. So therefore, I'm just going to do the right, message right. of this is what you need to know. And so you lose something in the middle there, which is the opportunity to be entertaining without having to stretch it into humor. And so I'm interested in your that, that topic there, of really expand a little bit around um, how, how humor can be used and how it shouldn't be used right, in terms of the balance there of, of where is it dangerous to get into humor and how can entertainment be used clearly without humor Right, so without that risk or fear yeah, that people have. Uh, yeah, this is a this is a fast way that we could probably do a whole podcast on this too. Like the, um, I think you said something in there which is really important. Is like there, there's no one size fits fits all, and it is viewed at. I use the word polarizing, but you know the same thing that draws people to to my company. They're like, oh, that sounds really interesting. Is also the same thing that scares them. They're like, oh gosh, we can't do humor. But you hear that and you're like, what are you? Like my company tried humor once and it didn't work. Like think of how crazy that sounds, right? <laughs> you know, you have 5,000 employees or 10,000 employees, which means you have 10,000 different opinions and that, and there are maybe general sensibilities within cultures, you know, but like if you have an office in Spain, I guarantee that the, all the employees in Spain do not think like a monolith they have. There's a variety of, of opinions. So I, and there's some practical realities, like you got a big company, you got a limited time and resources. So people try and buy a resource or make a thing and push it out to everybody. That's not ideal. Like, you know, if you tell me to, to create a, some video content to engage 20,000 people around the globe, it's near impossible to do. Um, so, which is why I advocate variety and surprise, which is not putting all your eggs in one basket and trying lots of things or segmenting your audience if you can. If you say, I need to create a video for Spain, that's easier, <laughs> you know, uh, or, or for this job function. Um, but I get there's some practical realities of, that makes that hard. Um, I also, th I wanna point out that I think that thinking about funny or not funny is the wrong question um for for the reasons that we just discussed um 
I think the whole idea is, let's go back to the beginning of this podcast. What are we trying to do? We're trying to show up with an open hand versus a finger wag. We're trying to, to let people know that you have their back. Um, we want people to pay attention to these, notice these messages, pay attention to them, internalize them and recognize that they have help and support. Um, and uh, there's a, a quote from John Cleese that I love uh, from Monty Python fame. John Cleese says that the main evolutionary significance of humor is it gets people from the closed mode to the open mode faster than anything else. Uh, and to me, that sums up really nicely what I think we're talking about here. Um, whether they think that the training video is funny or not is irrelevant. Do they, do they uh, look, and let's just make an assumption that we're not offending and we don't have like some, some red herring in there that's like, you know, we missed something. Like the, all the content we make, we always approach it from the point of empathy. How do employees feel about this? Um, what do they know to be true? Uh, and then we start from that truth and create from that so that we're not uh, talking, punch, they say, don't, you never punch down, you know, you never, your humor should never punch down. You can punch up at authority. You can, you can punch up at the, the, the constrictions of regulation and how that drives everybody crazy. You can punch up at bureaucracy. There's all sorts of things that we can do to build trust amongst your, your viewing audience around the issue so that they'll pay attention. Um, um, uh, another thing you mentioned was, uh, so, so, uh, well, I would, I would say that humor is really good to exaggerate a bad behavior. Um, so heighten a bad behavior, uh, and to put that on a character sometimes, as opposed to an employee is helpful because you're, you're saying like, we're not saying that you do this, but this character is doing it. And of course, if, if those people are doing it, then they'll see something of that in themselves. So it's, it's a nice way to veil the truth. You know, if you get my point, you know, you're veiling the truth. So it's a way to bring truth forward. Um, I like that aspect of it. I tend to use storytelling a lot because an interesting story doesn't have to be funny, but you can really weave. I mean, we've all like when you're sitting uh, with a, a loved one or a friend at a bar or a restaurant and you're, you're like, oh my God, this thing happened. And then you're telling this story. You can really weave an interesting tale about an issue and it, let's face it most of the issues are in compliance are meaty interesting issues filled with drama um, some of the most best content we've made over the last couple of years are either creating videos based on real stories um, uh, or getting leaders to tell stories about integrity that happened to them that challenged their perspective and we would maybe frame that up inside a talk show or you know, like I, I love the idea of actually pairing a professional co comedian or, or entertainer with real people so that real people can just be themselves and we can handle the freight of the quote unquote entertainment. But really, we're just a, a vessel to have enough entertainment in there so that people can tell their story about these very weighty issues. So I, anyway, that's an interesting technique uh, to me, which is if you have something that's more nuanced than a 30 second message, tell a story and tell that story in, in not a talking head video, like tell a story. <laughs> and we all know what that means, you know, uh, uh, you know, with, with real language and, and vulnerability and heroes and villains and the twists and turns, and things along those lines. So let, let me pause there just to, I don't want to keep everyone yeah. too long. That's, that's, Tell a story is something that you know we've talked about many times, um, and I think you say we all know what that means. I think oh, actually we okay. don't all know what that means. The the ability, the, the how to tell a story and the story arc is something that Jenna has run sessions on, in fact, very well, um, really helping people understand what that story arc looks like, the need for a hero, a villain, uh, mm -hmm. for adversity and overcoming adversity. So I, that's a very powerful thing. We can do a whole session on that sometime. But Ronnie, I really want to thank you for everything you've shared with us. There were some wonderful points in there. I've been scribbling notes. Um, we started with the, the don't don't be perceived as pushing liability to them, right? That's that stepping away from that. I thought it was a wonderful quote. The I, I got your back message is something I'm going to carry away from this and use that. I think that was phenomenally empowering as a team to say, I got your back is wonderful. Um, 
easy to be brave when you're not alone. Um, really getting that message out, fantastic. Having frequency of communication, ensuring it is entertaining to be engaging, building trust, using humor to open people up. Um, keep changing your content to make sure it is constantly fresh and meaningful. And it's not about one size fits all. There isn't a single solution. So you've got to use lots of different techniques. And I thought it was a phenomenal um, set of uh, points that you gave us there. And there was a lot more meat in the, in the discussion that you provided. So thank you so much for that. That was just what I captured. Um, but yeah, wonderful. Thank you for the, the, uh, for the chat. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. And uh, uh, be entertaining, people. Enjoy yourselves. <laughs> thanks, Ronnie. Thanks very much. Don't forget to subscribe to The Ethics Movement on Apple Podcasts or follow us on Spotify to get notified when we have a new episode. And follow Conversant by One Trust on LinkedIn for more content about how to evolve your ethics and compliance program. Thanks for joining us. I'm Tom Fox. And I'm Philip Winterburn.